Hello, and welcome to the Drew Expanse. Today we're going to be looking at Asrite and explaining what it is. Or, more precisely, I'm going to be offering you what I think it is and hopefully giving enough supporting evidence to convince you of such. Part 1 is the only required piece of watching if you want to understand the theory that you're about to listen to. Part 2 is extensions and conspiracy theories that attach to Part 1. It's not required watching, however, if you do enjoy Part 1 and you are convinced, I would highly suggest watching Part 2, because it's got some very interesting things. As a warning, I just want to make it clear that there will be spoilers for Before the Storm in this video. And before we begin, I need to thank a lot of Shinies and Lucky Doos who put me onto the trail of this theory by directing me to the Razor Fan in A Thousand Needles. And actually, let's begin from there. If you've managed to survive part two of Spore Mountain Theory, you already know what I'm thinking in regards to A Thousand Needles. However, one very interesting item which comes from A Thousand Needles is the Doomstone. The Doomstone, for reference, is a stone that came from the Animus, a primal elemental that Twilight's Hammer had somehow created and was attempting to use to blow up a thousand needles with. No reason was given, I might add. The important points learnt in a thousand needles is the Doomstone can absorb a vast amount of energy, amplify that energy, and the result was the Animus. The reason that's important is because during Legion, we finally get to see what the Doomstone looks like in the Shulman Order Hall campaign, and from there the quacks begin to roll. Why? Well, the Doomstone has an uncanny, almost identical shape, size, and look to the demon slash dragon soul, the featureless golden disc that Naltherian, otherwise known as Deathwing, the cause of the Cataclysm, created to steal a great portion of the Dragon Aspect's power. The chain of said Demon Soul was also Elementium. This coincidence had no relevance, until the reveal of Azerite, and the eventual display of the properties Azerite seems to have. The idea of a powerful substance bringing with it some form of magical energy that can be used to amplify a being's power, give inspiration to a person, ideas as well, naturally heal, is near indestructible, drastically increases the growth of plant life, has been theorized to increase the duration of a person's life, and strangely enough makes a person feel at ease, was a very interesting introduction to the World of Warcraft universe. And that's not mentioning the reveal that Azerite can apparently change colors. Galux's ruby-tipped cane turned out to be a form of Azerite that turned gold upon Sargeras' sword in Pale of the World. From a storyteller's standpoint, you could almost call Azerite the ultimate MacGuffin, though that's when another piece of information introduced in Legion starts to really hit home, as well as the apparently cancelled Rathion questline in regards to Naltherian's lair. In Legion, the drug bar introduced, and you finally find out Naltherian had been experimenting on elementals. The fact he was still Naltherian when these experiments occurred implies that they are at least 10,000 plus years old and happened before he took up the name Deathwing. This is where the first assumption and theory occurs. It has been relatively assumed Elementium was the final result of Deathwing's experiments with the elements. What I'm suggesting is, what if it wasn't? What if it was just the byproduct? The golden disc that was used to harness the power of the aspects and create the demon soul has a very ambiguous history. The only pieces of information given about the disc specifically say it was apparently created by goblin artificers, Natharian's blood was given in the forging, and it was forged on anvils deep beneath the earth. What is known about the Dragon Soul, though, is it was able to obliterate most of the Blue Dragon flight through projecting a powerful radiant energy, it destroyed Natharian's body because of the power it contained, it could contain the power of four aspects 
who were apparently blessed by the Titans. And where it did not have the ability to bring someone to ease, it was able to bring unease in a person. The old god spoke to Neltherian through the Dragon Soul and enabled his madness. So, what if Elementium was the byproduct? The failed experiments of Neltherian's research on Azerite and his failed attempts at recreating the golden disc that was used to create the demon soul. What if Neltherian went mad trying to create artificial Azerite? Stable Azerite. What if that's what the old god's original plan for the Earth border was? What if Azerite was one of the original points of the Cataclysm? We've seen what Sargeras' sword did. Is it hard to believe Deathwing's emergence wasn't trying to have the same effect? As for a thousand needles, what if the Twilight's Hammer wasn't attempting to blow up the area? What if they were attempting to create Azerite? Or were merely experimenting on it? What if Azerite's been the key to the Old God's escape all this time, and it's why the Well of Eternity and the Dragon Soul have been so important to the Old God's plans? Stuff to think about, but to continue on with Naltharian, if he was trying to create Azerite, why is Elementium the byproduct? For this, you're going to have to bear with me, because there is an explanation, but I have to go through a few points before I get to the main explanation. If the first volume of Chronicle is correct, then Azeroth and Titan World Souls feed off spirit to grow. It is why the Elemental Lords once ruled Azeroth's surface. The planet lacked spirit. Or, did it more precisely, have spirit, but did Azeroth, a titan, a living world, convert that spirit into blood, into Azerite? Now, before I hear the screams of you're using Chronicle or you're using Chronicle and you're being way too literal, just wait for the punchline. Spirit-infused stone is not a concept I pulled out of my ass. Draenor, both Draenors actually, at the start of the planet's cycle was saturated with the spirit of life. Or more precisely, the fifth element. Now, where I know thoughts of Druidism and the Emerald Dream are probably coming to mind, ignore them. The word life has about five-ish different meanings in World of Warcraft, most of them coming from Krogol. The meaning used in this case is the one you're not going to believe is real, the one you're going to want to remember, the one that proves Pandaria had extremely relevant lore, and is this quotable definition from five pages into the preface of Chronicle Volume 1. To do so, they called upon the primordial forces of spirit and decay. Those who seek to bring balance to the elements rely on spirits, sometimes referred to as the fifth element by shaman or chi by monks. This life-giving force interconnects and binds all things in existence as one. I'll let that sink in, but yes, that is a legit quote. And yes, that is a legit thing. And where Chronicle definitely doesn't give the full picture on the history of the universe, it does give very enlightening snippets. So, assuming that statement isn't wrong, do you now understand why Azerite is called life blood? As in, it's quite literally lifeblood of the universe? Spirit infused stone on Draenor had the exact same effect as Azerite on plants. It causes them to overgrow. But this isn't the punchline, by the way. Because how all this relates to Elementium comes in the form of Grond, the giant who was created by Agrimar 
on Draenor from the simple ingredients of fire, earth, air, and water, as well as Draenor's largest mountain, which at this point still had an abundance of the fifth element, spirit, within it. Grond eventually dies. However, creatures called the Colossals rise from his blood. The Colossals are made out of the same ingredients as Grond. The catch with the Colossals is, when they died, they burnt away and expended their life essence. And what was left was the near indestructible metal Black Rock Ore. Black Rock Ore and Elementium share near identical traits. Both are described as almost and or just being indestructible when crafted properly. Both share the trait of being incredibly hard to smelt, and their creation, considering how the Twilight's Hammer treated the elements during the Cataclysm, should also seem very familiar. The Twilight's Hammer was forcefully pulling elementals out of Azeroth, and they were using shadow magic to do so. So, consider this. The Twilight's Hammer pulls multiple elementals out of Azeroth, and took pieces of their spirit as fuel for their shadow magic. Some were bound as slaves, while others were killed in the process, and fused together to create Elementium, a spiritless, the indestructible ore made of the four elements that Naltherian so long ago accidentally created, trying to recreate Azerite. And the punchline is, Elementium has multiple colours. Darkshaw, the deep pole, if you want proof. But hell, even in the old RPG, Sulfurus, the hammer of the Fire Lord himself, was made of the stuff. So, Azerite, quite plausibly, not a MacGuffin. And if Elementium is the spiritless form of Azerite, then the plot of Azerite and its relation to Azeroth as a whole has been hinted at since AQ, with the idea of the volatility of the old gods in their conflict with their minions creating Elementium, which, thanks to Chronicle Volume 1, we find out is the Old God's conflict with the Elemental Lords, who they eventually enslaved. Though, if Spirit is the binding factor, and Azerite is charged with the stuff, then Azerite is way more powerful than we actually realise as we are quite literally dealing with a mineral that has the properties of interconnecting and binding all things in existence as one. Turns out Blizz wasn't joking when they said we're basically in the middle of a nuclear arms race. Now, for me personally, this explained a lot about lore in regards to a few things, like blood, in regards to why we've actually fought physical blood, and the reason being is because it's got an abundance of spirit in it, to Sauronite, which may have been Azerite, but was infected with the blood of Yogg-Saron, or possibly just the power of Yogg-Saron, right? But I am curious, what is your take? Do you think this is a bit off the deep end, or do you think it's within the realms of reason? Leave a comment, I do want to hear your opinion. Speculation cannot be done without community. As I said at the beginning, part two will continue this theory on into the realm of pseudo-theories and conspiracies. And if you did find this to be convincing, then I guarantee you, you will enjoy part two. However, if not, thank you for coming. If you did enjoy it though, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment, share it around if you think it's noteworthy. And until next time, have a nice day.